Recent laws in Idaho are having a bigger impact than probably intended, like hindering how healthcare workers do their jobs or whether they want to do it here, and how hospitals are able to hire their replacements. Learning loss during COVID was a real thing, and to stop it, Idaho tried to help parents financially. But it seems some of that money was used improperly, and now the auditing of the Empowering Parents program has begun. There's family reunions, there's romantic reunions, but what about a reunion because of an art show? All right, we're gonna tell you about a crazy coincidence that happened after we showed a story on a local gallery. I counsel patients about complicated complications for their babies every day. And right now the only option I can give in a situation like that is traveling out of state, leaving their family, and having to spend money to travel and fly somewhere else. And even that isn't clear if that's something maternal medicine doctors can do these days in Idaho, recommend their patients travel out of state for an abortion. Okay, that was Dr. Lauren Miller a little more than a month ago talking to us about how Idaho's abortion bans are putting doctors in a precarious position when it comes to how they're allowed to treat their pregnant patients. Sure, the original va vague language of the law was cleaned up a bit this last legislative session, but even that fix didn't do enough, says Dr. Miller, who is the organizer of the Idaho Coalition for Safe Reproductive Health Care. How close to death does a patient have to be before her doctor can act, perform an abortion, to save her life? That question is leaving doctors in the dark, or they're just leaving the state altogether. Dr. Miller actually conducted a survey of 117 physicians and advanced practice providers during the legislative session, asking if Idaho's abortion laws are driving doctors away. The question was, are you considering relocating out of state in the next year? 48 of them said they're seriously thinking about it. 42 said, no, they're not planning on leaving. But 27 said, well, they're kind of considering it. And then if you are planning on or considering leaving, is it because of Idaho's restrictive abortion laws? Of the 75 that said they were thinking about it or considering it or were seriously thinking about it, 97%, 73 of them said, yes, it's because of Idaho's restrictive abortion laws. Of the 10 doctors with her level of expertise in the state of Idaho, by the way, Dr. Miller told us two are already leaving as a direct result of Idaho criminalizing abortion. That's 20%. And it's not just reproductive health care providers that are feeling the pinch of politics in Idaho. Dr. Ted Epperly, formerly of the Central District Health Board, currently the president and CEO of a residency program here in the Treasure Valley. Dr. Epperly says we're not just at risk of losing practicing physicians because of our laws, but future physicians too. He told Boise State Public Radio in March, he interviewed 400 of his potential students to his residency program, and he said he expects one in five, 20%, to choose to train somewhere else, outside of Idaho, which is significant because according to the Association of Medical Colleges, a majority of doctors stay in the state where they are trained. And it's not just the abortion laws. Idaho now bans puberty blockers and hormone therapy for minors. And it's not just the physicians who are frustrated with the path Idaho is taking when it comes to these private decisions between a patient, their family, and their health care provider. Those whose job it is to hire and retrain them or retain them are having a problem with it too. We have providers that are deciding to leave this wonderful state because of the political extremists and the, and the political views that are distressing to health care workers. Odette Bellano is the president and CEO of St. Alphonsus Health System, the second largest in the state. Odette said what she said last week at the introduction of Idaho Leaders United. It's a group of business and law enforcement leaders who hope to rid Idaho of political violence and extremism. This idea about a brain drain, people choosing to take their talents elsewhere or not come at all, is something we've heard before. But when we heard the leader of the only advanced trauma center in the state say it, we had to ask more about it. She told us when people or companies consider moving here from out of state, they ask about infrastructure and they ask about health care. The two things that matter most when deciding where to live. If you ask any hospital CEO or health system CEO, what's their number one focus? It's workforce. You add a disadvantage of political extremists in your state, you have much more work to do. I'll read this back to you. you. said, we have providers that are deciding to leave this wonderful state. Because of the political extremists and the, and the political views that are distressing to health care workers. Mm -hmm. What did you mean by that? Can you be specific? Yeah. I can tell you that uh, maternal fetal medicine physicians who are critical to very complex, complicated 
pregnancies are choosing to leave. We've lost two-thirds of our MFMs, what we call them MFM physicians, in the last month. Wow, that's and, a lot. And the state, I, I won't talk for others, but the state has lost at least another four. And there's only about nine or ten in the entire state. How many are we talking, like numbers? How many do you guys have? So we have three. Three. We're down to one who is looking to um, retire in six months. It's not only the uh, maternal fetal medicine physicians that are feeling a, a lot of anxiety of how do they practice medicine in a state where they feel very vulnerable to being prosecuted, but how do then those obstetricians that depend on them for those high complex pregnancies, how do they feel and how do they practice without the expertise of that complexity care. So it's a domino effect. It's a very much, and then you, you also have across the state family practice uh, physicians that do delivery, especially in our rural areas. And the lack of support that they may be feeling, and they're one removed from an obstetrician. And ability to recruit at this point is very, very um, limited. Uh, we're just not getting people app applying for those positions. We've had a number of physicians that even before they come to interview with us, that many times the first question is, well, I think I really want to come, but I'm not sure about the political climate and whether or not I want to subject myself and my family to that. So we've had many physicians, I won't know for a, for a fact that it was that, but after those conversations, they don't even return our call. Is it just maternal medicine? No, an orthopedic uh, surgeon that we were um, interviewing just stopped talking to us at some point, had the same thing happen in cardiology. So no, it's just not maternal fetal medicine. It's not just uh, obstetricians. You can't help but thinking, obviously, it's the laws that are kind of leading to this. Not necessarily the political climate, but the actual laws that are kind of changing the way people want to stay or come to Idaho. Well, and I would also um, say that some of the rhetoric that comes out during the legislative session, for example, I believe that there was someone who was trying to introduce a bill that criminalized providers that provided the COVID vaccine. Yep. So it's, it's all over the place, right? Physicians go into medicine, healthcare workers, I'm a nurse by background, went into medicine to help and serve others. When you're thinking that your profession could actually lead to you being criminally charged, I think that you consider whether you come into a very difficult environment. If Idaho loses half of its advanced practiced physicians when it comes to these fields, and 20% across the border saying we don't want to go there, what's the outlook for Idaho? Yeah when it comes to healthcare? I would say it's pretty grim if we don't do something about it. Who needs to hear this? I think the people of Idaho need to hear this, right? We need everybody to stand up, to join us in our coalition, denouncing political extremists, bigotry, and hate. What about the lawmakers? I think the le legislators, right? We are hopefully a government of the people for the people, right? And I think that they need to listen to the majority of the residents of Idaho, that we want to be inclusive, that we want to make sure that we have civil discord, that we have discussions and that we make the right decisions with all information and not have political extremists driving the entire state. So staffing in the medical field is not anything new and it's certainly not unique to Idaho. There's a shortage across the country right now that could lead to a deficit of about 120,000 primary care physicians over the next 10 years. Odette says they've offered incentives at St. Alphonsus, like signing bonuses to draw applicants. They've looked internationally. They've considered apprenticeships. They've even tried to encourage middle school students to get them early into a medical field track. Just hopefully they can turn this trend around by the time those kids grow up. But right now, their biggest obstacle is the political climate, as you heard her say, and the rhetoric and things like doxing and the physical and verbal violence healthcare workers face on a daily basis. And of course, the result of that climate. Odette didn't want to say the quiet part out loud, but, but we can. It's the laws that handcuff doctors who just want to help people, doctors who could actually end up in handcuffs themselves 
should they decide on a procedure that considers the health of the mother, not just the life, but the health of the mother, or the gender identity of a teenager? It's the laws. Education choice and how to fund it took center stage during this last legislation, or last legislative session, I should say. Remember the education savings accounts? Well, that plan failed, and for many, the problem was a lack of oversight in both curriculum and in the finances. But there's already an education fund, which is already on Idaho's books, which is now having to have its books examined. The Empowering Parents Program. They were grants that were meant to help families acquire educational tools for their kids, which was a big help during the pandemic, and apparently a little loose with the oversight. Joe Paris tells us a state review of the program is now ramping up after some purchases were flagged. In recent years, the state of Idaho has rolled out a few programs that gets money to Idaho families to help them cover learning costs for their students. In 2020, the Strong Families, Strong Students program was launched to help address challenges the COVID pandemic had on students learning from home. Grants were sent to eligible families to help them buy things like computers, software, other devices for learning, maybe even internet, instructional materials. You get the idea. The popular program inspired another COVID area idea, the Empowering Parents Program. Like the Strong Families, Strong Students Program, Empowering Parents, it sends Idaho families with students funds that can be used to purchase educational goods and services. And the idea here is to take on COVID learning loss. So families are eligible for grants up to $1,000 per student with a maximum award of $3,000 per family. And those grant dollars are used in an online marketplace where families can get supplies and educational materials. Idaho law surrounding this program makes it clear, money has to be used on eligible education expenses. Idaho Code 33-1030 gives a definition in detail on what is and it is not eligible. And since programs like Empowering Parents have rolled out, there's been fair questions about who's keeping track and if all dollars are going to eligible purchases. Now, the Office of the State Board of Education says they're conducting a review of purchases made with the grants. Back in mid-February, State Board staff says that they noticed some purchases for things such as clothing, televisions, and smartwatches, as well as household cleaning supplies, appearing to not be eligible. So, what happens now? Well, a spokesperson tells me the board office is undertaking this review and its responsibility to administer the program using a third party vendor to manage and operate the platform where empowering parent grants funds are expended. And that third party vendor is called Odyssey. And they have a contract with the state of Idaho to run the online marketplace. I reached out to Odyssey for comments and to find out how they deal with claims and oversight of misuse of dollars. They were not able to respond immediately, so we're still going back to them. But my question, what happens to families that did break purchase rules, either unintentionally or on purpose? Now, State Board of Education, they point me to Idaho Code 33-1031, and it says, quote, 
If a parent is found to misuse grant funds, then neither the parent nor another parent of a student living in the same household may apply for a grant in the future for any student, provided that the parent may appeal the finding to the board. So I reached out to the state superintendent of public instructions office for a reaction to this whole thing, and they tell me, quote, we were first contacted about this Friday afternoon and reached out to the board to learn more. We'll continue to stay in touch as they look into the matter. And we saw your comments and questions about the grants and the oversight when these programs have been rolling out over the last few years. So now we're coming back to this, and this is kind of why we're bringing you the story is in terms of the oversight, here's what it looks like. Now, I just want to mention, though, just last week, an announcement about the future of this program, the Empowering Parents Grant. Well, it was made, and it's going to continue with more applications and millions of dollars being available this fall. So, Brian, there's a countdown now on another round of grants that I've, I've spoken to families in Idaho. They say the grants have been very helpful, and they've been able to get you know, learning materials for their kids, their students at home. The question is, though, as the State Department, or excuse me, the State Board of Education is going to look at some of the spending and the oversight, it, it makes you wonder if it'll make the legislature or Idahoans kind of squeamish when we have more programs like this, i.e. ESAs. How widespread are we looking at here with this, with this audit? Right now, uh, they're just getting into the review. At this point, they're going to figure out exactly what the, the scope of it looks like. Again, back in February, they started to notice, hey, maybe that purchase isn't eligible. That one's not either. I did reach out to the third-party vendor that actually has a contract with the state of Idaho. I reached out to them to try to get some more information. What does their process look like on the back end? Did not immediately get a response back, but would love to circle back to see, you know, who's watching all this. But ultimately, this is kind of how it's supposed to work. Yeah. There's a question, somebody goes, that doesn't look right, and they look into it. Checks and balances. All right, thank you very much, Joe. Well, the court has spoken, and the verdict is in. We're not talking about Lori Vallow, Dave, we're talking about former Boise City Council member Lisa Sanchez's lawsuit against the city. Remember, she was removed from the city council because she had moved out of her district, and then she moved back into her district and wanted her seat back, but the city had already opened it up for others to kind of jump in there. Well, she was on the short list to return, but the city ended up going with somebody else. So she sued the city in an effort to get back on that city council in a different way. Sanchez's lawyer, Wendy Olson, she asked the court to stop the Boise City Council from taking any action until Sanchez was reinstated, basically shut down and do no business. But today, Judge Derek O'Neill denied Sanchez's request for a preliminary injunction based on a state code. Olson said a court should have decided if Sanchez's seat was vacant, but section that section of that code says, quote, if an incumbent is no longer resident of the district in which they are elected, well, that office is vacant. It's open. And that's how the court saw it, too. The judge only ruled on that preliminary injunction, by the way. No other ongoing aspects of the lawsuit. So that has still yet to be determined. So we could maybe see her back on city council. Well, we'll see.
I love Art Deco landscape because it's, you have variety of landscapes, you know, you have the mountains, you have the rivers, you have the lakes, canyons, and the forest, and the desert, farm field, we have everything here. We have beautiful skies in Idaho. You, you will not find any, any better skies in the, over the United States, you know. That appreciation for the outdoors, Bill Garabian gleaned from his father. I was in his studio since I was a little kid, <laughs> running around, playing with the toys. He was painting outside, I was watching him, you know, and we were going to countryside, I was watching him too. That's how I fell in love with the landscapes. So I decided if I will be a painter, I'll paint only landscapes only. All right, so a couple weeks ago, we introduced you to Bill Garabian. He's an artist and owner of the Idaho Art Gallery in Meridian. We originally aired that story because he opened his gallery to guest artists, the public, to see and buy their pieces. So what's also interesting about Bill is that he was born and raised in the former Soviet Union. And as you heard, his father remembered the Soviet Art Society. Bill moved to Twin Falls with his family in 1991 to escape what was then still a Soviet Union. But it's a good state to live in, Idaho is, if you're inspired by landscapes, but still kind of scary if you don't really know anybody. Not knowing anybody was quickly resolved, though, for Bill and his family. After that story aired, we got an email from Dennis and Mary Lynn Culp, who now live in Meridian. But in 1991, they lived in Twin Falls, and they worked for the College of Southern Idaho Refugee Center. And their job was to resettle refugees. The Culps met the Garabians at the Twin Falls Airport in 1991 and helped them move into their apartment, when they told us. They hung out for about an hour with them that first day, and they became friends, enjoying meals and, of course, the occasional salute of vodka. The Culps moved away from Twin Falls in 1996 and lost, lost touch with the Garabians. Then the Culps saw our story of Bill's gallery opening on Friday the 21st, actually recognized his name. They said they were dumbfounded to hear it, they wrote. So they went to the showing that night. And the two families got together for the first time in almost two decades. You can imagine the tugs and the tears. Mary Lynn told us it was such a heartwarming evening for us and brought back such wonderful memories. We will now get together with this family and pick up where we left off. They are wonderful people and hard workers who got their citizenship as soon as they could. We cannot say enough about this family, Mary Lynn said. The Culps even bought Bill's painting of the Prime Bridge, as you just saw that. I'm willing to bet there was a shot of vodka involved. There's nothing better about doing these stories like these than learning how much it meant or it means to bridge the gap lost to all those years, to bring these folks back together, which is why we want to thank you for sharing your story with us. All right, Idaho Gives, Idaho's largest fundraising event of the year going on right now. So we're about 17 hours or so into this, and you've already helped us raise more than $800,000. It's pushed the total amount raised in its 11-year history of Idaho Gives to more than $20 million. Last year, more than 13,000 donors raised more than $3.6 million for 672 nonprofits. Now is your time to get involved this year. For a complete list of nonprofits and to donate, you can visit IdahoGives.org and donate right now through this Thursday.
Now, we got a lot of long messages today about, well, the laws in this state, recent laws, and kind of what it's doing to the health care uh, business in this state as well. But let's get to a, a few of them. This one from Kyle in Nampa says, the CEO of St. Alphonsus is correct. Because of laws and political climate, all the health care will suffer. Case in point, my primary care doctor refused to answer my question on whether I should get a booster vaccine, the COVID vaccine. It's only going to get worse from here if things don't change, says Kyle. But then there's this view. As a local medical provider, I think it's overly simplistic to blame the provider shortage on politics. There are other barriers way, that way supersede politics. More importantly, failure of systems to pay comp competitive wages ridiculous cost of living and movement away from big systems of private practice. Boise has lost its, quote, curb appeal. There are better places to practice. It's not all politics and not all specialties are the same. That's well, point well said, Chris. I'm a nurse who works in the ER frequently. Providing care to a pregnant woman in the ER setting scares the hell out of me. Given the political climate in the state, I have seriously considered leaving for a safer work environment. That is a Twin Falls nurse. This one here. Brian, we voted on the laws on murder, abortion. If they want to leave, let them. And transgender, let them. They knew it's a red state when they moved here. Good and COVID vaccine is wrong. I love my doctors. They have my views, says this. Here's the thing you probably need to realize, though. Not all abortions are about birth control and not all hormone therapy is about transgender minors. It covers a lot of stuff. We'll see you back here tomorrow.